Hi and welcome to About Books. In this week's episode, we talk with Spencer Lee, broadcaster, author, journalist, astonishing person. Come and join us. Spencer Lee, well, thank you for inviting us into this amazing room. I mean, everywhere I look, I see names from my past and books I want to read. Extraordinary place. I've been reading your latest, Simon and Garfunkel, Together Alone. Um, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful book. Can you walk us through the process of writing such a book? Because I believe its origins head all the way back to the 70s. Indeed, yes. It was a fir the first book that I ever wrote was a book called Paul Simon Now and Then in 1973. And a publisher uh, said to me that he wanted to reprint this book. Mm. And I thought, oh no, I hadn't looked at the book for some years and I thought I might have some very dodgy views in there. <laughs> so I wasn't too keen that night. I read it again and I thought, well, parts of it aren't too bad, but a song like Mother and Child Reunion, I, I didn't know that my... Uh, sort of 28 year old self didn't actually like reggae <laughs> and I dismissed this song uh, mm. and I thought that's a catastrophic opinion there. And because I, of I, its reggae influences. So, yes, yeah, yes yeah. and I, I thought why on earth did I, I write that down but it, it was obviously me at the time yeah. and I thought well I've got to restructure this book mm. and anyway I mean that book finished in 1973 mm. so there's all that they've done since then mm. and so I regard it as, as, a, as a new book and I set out to find things as well. I mean, I'm, I suppose when I do a book on someone, I look first of all at the things that they've done in this area and then widen it out to the UK and then deal with the stuff that they've done in America. Mm. <laughs> so the, when I did the book on Frank Sinatra uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, one of the first things I was looking at him looking at was Frank Sinatra playing golf in Southport. Oh, right. <laughs> and so you, you get the local things yeah, sorted yeah, out first. Yeah. It gives, gives you some confidence because I know what I'm writing about. Yeah. I know these streets. Uh, I know the places. So it's, it's very easy for me. Whereas if I'm writing about Brooklyn, I've never been to Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, it's more difficult for me to yeah. write about that. So that's generally how I approach things anyway. Um, my, my first port of call, actually, when I do a book is usually to write a list of questions that I want a book to answer. And then I see if I can actually answer those questions as I go through. So what was your number one question regarding Simon and Garfunkel that you would want to ask or, or answer? Well, one of the things I wanted to sort out was what they actually did between 1957, when they made a record called Hey School Girl that made the American charts, and 1963-64, when they made the album Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., mm. and then Paul Simon comes over to England. What had happened in those intervening years? And uh, it, it was quite fascinating. I, I knew there were a few records that they'd worked on, that Paul Simon had been the lead vocalist with Tico and the Triumphs, and then got to number 99 in the Hot 100 with a song called Motorcycle. But I didn't know the extent of what he was doing. And I came up with over 50 examples of records where Paul Simon or Art Garfunkel had contributed to it in some way. So they really learnt their craft getting involved in something I, like that. I found that in yes. really interesting because yeah. I've been following them, but probably from the Sounds of Silence on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what is great about doing something like that is even 10 years ago, if I wrote a book like that, I would be mentioning obscure records the people wouldn't, the normal person wouldn't be able to hear or they may find an expensive CD with yeah. them on or something like that. But nowadays it's just so easy. And I noticed that with the Frank Sinatra book that, I mean, that's a big book. He made nearly a hundred films. He mm. uh, made over 2000 records, mm. uh, piles and piles of stuff that he did, lots and lots of live shows. 
but so much of it is on the net now. Yeah. You can read anything in that Sinatra book where he comes across a particular track. You come across a particular track and you think, I'd like to hear that. Just go on YouTube and it's there. I've so been, it's changed yeah. the nature of writing about music books because anybody can check up on what you do, which is a good thing in yeah. a way. Um, so, so you have to find something pertinent to say about these it's, tracks. You can't say, I, I can't find it. It's changed the nature of reading such books as well because I find myself reading it alongside my computer. Yes, yeah. And having the soundtrack yeah. playing as yeah. I'm reading the Simon I mean, and there are a few book. things in my in my original uh, Simon and Garfunkel book from 1973 where I, where I do say um, Simon did this, but I haven't got any record of this. I don't know what this <laughs> sounds like. Yes. And, uh, you can't do that no. now. It, it's all it's all there. Yeah, I mean, quite. my next book will be on Elvis, and there's mm. just so much on Elvis out there. It is it is amazing what's what's on the net. I mean. This is a great benefit of computer, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a fear that I'm going to wake up one morning and they say, it's all a dream. There's no such thing as YouTube <laughs> at all. But yes. it, it is Going back to the thing. library would be very difficult now, wouldn't well, it? Well, yes. It's I mean, considering the amount of research that I've done for some books, yeah. and people don't do that sort of thing anymore. No, no. And I mean, I, I love looking through written, written files and of correspondence and the like, and yeah. uh, trying to come to some conclusions yeah. and things, and seeing things that people perhaps haven't seen before. When I did the Sinatra book, I went to the BBC Written Archives in Cavisham, and they have a file on Frank Sinatra there and his radio appearances in the 1950s and the like. And no one had taken that out before. That's amazing. And I thought, this is amazing. You've got yeah. all this stuff there. And Frank Sinatra is saying, in 1953 this is, he says, I won't do this program with the Cyril Stapleton Band Show unless I get the cover of the Radio Times. And the editor of the Radio yeah. Times says, you can't dictate to us. He can't appear in the programme if, he, wow. if he's going to be like that. And, but then eventually they write to him and say, we're terribly sorry, Mr. Sinatra, you can't be on the cover of the Radio Times because it's the week of the coronation. And that is such an insight though, isn't it? And oh, yeah. An insight into social history as well. Yeah. And Fascinating. I, and, I, and when I was writing that down, I was making myself laugh. Yes. You know, I, mean, I, was, I was shaking with laughter as I was writing all this because I was thinking when people read it they're going to find amusing too and yeah. nobody, not even the keenest Sinatra fan would know about all that yeah. and it was a great insight into Sinatra's personality yeah. and even he had to back down because the Queen wanted the cover of the Radio Times <laughs> <laughs> Let's forget these names yes. for a minute and let's take you back to your own origins uh, Liverpool born and bred? Yes indeed, yes At a rather special time I would say Did you pick up a guitar? No, I didn't. No, I mean, I, uh, I, I'm I'm not musical at all. I don't, I don't <laughs> think, and which which is a pity because I, I I'd love to be love to have been the group and such. I but, share that pity with yeah, you. Yes, but I mean, I was born in 1945. Yeah. Um, I went into insurance, I qualified as an actuary. I worked in life insurance for many years, but I always. Uh, wrote things on the side, as it were, did little articles or did the occasional book and things. Mm. And then uh, when I took early retirement, when the Royal and Sun Alliance merged at the end of the 1990s, I thought, well, I'll make my hobby my career now, really. Mm. Um, I'd always been doing shows on Radio Merseyside, and I've continued to do that. And uh, I think I'm probably the longest serving broadcaster on the station now. Well, congratulations. Uh, because I am OLD, unfortunately. <laughs> what are your memories of Mersey Beat? Um, very pleasant ones. I mean, the, the cavern was a sort of place that, uh, if your mother said that's a, that's a pl sort of place you shouldn't go, you'd to. be down you, there. You, di you didn't go there. No, no. Oh, no. really? <laughs> you were a good boy. Children weren't rebellious, you see, in those <laughs> days. And but I called the bands when they came into Crosby. I mean, I've, I'd have seen uh, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and St. Luke's Hall and mm. King Size Taylor mm. and the Dominoes, but not too many of them. Mm. And I, I regret that now. Mm. And also, I'd started studying for the actuarial exams, so, that, so I was quite studious and that was, that was taking up the time as well. Were your communication skills recognised at school? I don't. I don't because you're a so. very natural broadcaster. Well, and it's, you're it's a very, very natural writer. To say so, I, and I, I don't feel I've got great com communication skills at all. But I, I like telling a story. Yes, yeah. uh, in print, and I, I like telling a story on air too. Well, that comes across in the book. Uh, uh, 
Uh, so um, you have a very conversational way of writing. Uh, I mean, a good example in the Simon and Garfunkel book is where you're talking about buying the Tom and Jerry compilation. Uh, was it on Allegro? Yes. And you say it was for five shillings, and if only I'd bought the lot of them, I would be a rich man now. Oh, Something yeah. Along but, those well, lines. well that, that, that's certainly true. I mean, this was a, a compilation that came out in the 1960s when, mm. t when Simon and Garfunkel were famous. Mm. And it was put out by this label Allegro, and it was 10 tracks that they made in the 1950s, mm. including uh, Hey Schoolgirl. And Simon and Garfunkel were horrified that there was a current picture of them on the front. So it looked like a new Simon and Garfunkel album. And uh, they wanted to have it stopped. Yeah. And in fact, they did have it stopped. Uh, but for some reason, the people who pressed it, the record company, decided to sell all the remaining stock as a job lot to Woolworths. So, so in Woolworths... We will hear more about this tale straight after this break. Welcome back. So Simon and Garfunkel. Yep. Here we are. They're old stuff. Mm. They don't really want it heard, do they? Because they're forging ahead with yes. new stuff. Yeah. And this record label puts a new photo of them on this label of um, on this album of old stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, how was that resolved? Well, it, they took action against the record company, and the record company was told to withdraw the album. Mm. But in a strange move, the record company seems to have sold all its stock in a job lot to Woolworths. And all of a sudden, Woolworths in Liverpool had hundreds of this Simon and Garfunkel album for sale for 29 pence. Not or bad. Actually, it would have been six shillings, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever it was yeah. in those days. Very, very cheap indeed. And uh, I, I went in and bought a copy of that. Uh, and as I say in the book, I realise now that I, sh I should have bought a couple of hundred of them because uh, I'd, I'd have made quite a fortune on that. In a, sim in a similar way, um, w when they excavated the uh, cavern mm. uh, to, to rebuild the cavern in the 1980s, um, they sold cavern bricks. Mm. And you could buy an authentic cavern brick for five pounds. I mean, mine probably came from the toilets. I don't know where or anything. But uh, I mean, the ca the cavern bricks then became worth about two hundred and fifty pounds each. Really, uh, the good people of Japan Goodness. seem to love them. And yeah, these I'm bricks sure. have been imported out there. Well, why did I only buy one cavern brick? I should have bought a whole bloody wall, shouldn't I? If only we'd known. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, we would have been queuing at Nems for every record that came out uh, in, a, in, in a shed load of them. Yep. Um, Simon and Garfunkel, there seemed to be a conflict between the two from early on. Um, right from Paul's first solo song as uh, True Taylor, I believe you say. Oh, it, yeah. it, goes, it goes back be before that. I mean, this, this is what was fascinating about that when they were 10 years old, they were at a school production of Alice in Wonderland and Paul Simon was the White Rabbit and Art Garfunkel the Cheshire Cat. And they, they're always needling each other on stage when they are together and needling each other in print when they're not. And uh, Simon has said on stage, he's talked about this production and he said, you'll note that I had the starring role as a white rabbit and Garfunkel had the supporting role as the Cheshire Cat. In, in actual fact... Uh, it's, it's very honest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, it, casting Simon as the White Rabbit is, is, is actually perfect because uh, he's always late on the delivery of the albums and everything. <laughs> and one of the reasons that I, I said yes to doing a Simon Garfunkel book now after the Frank Sinatra one was because Sinatra did so much. If he didn't have anything going on that particular day, He'd say, oh, well, I'll make a guest appearance in a film. And uh, mm, he'd mm, do anything. Mm, he liked to keep busy mm. working the whole time. So he did so much. And a lot of what he did wasn't worthy of his talent, but it was mm. just that it, what, whatever was going at the time. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel, too, to a certain extent, aren't like that at all. They just do what they want to do, and they do it at their own pace. Mm. And so this book, which I've um, got the latest Paul Simon in, the album Stranger to Stranger that came out in 2016. I know that Simon won't make another album before 2020, so this book will remain uh, current for four years. At right, least, yes. right. <laughs> they are an interesting pairing. I yes. mean, similar to Lennon and McCartney in, in, in certain ways, um, in that they're, it's very fascinating, their tale. Yes, um, except that both Lennon and McCartney were writing the songs. 
Uh, oh, true, there is, true. but people often think that Garfunkel did write songs. Yeah. It was a, a remarkable edition of the Old Grey Whistle Test where Anne Nightingale was interviewing Paul Simon and uh, she, she asked him who wrote the words and who wrote the music. And Simon said, uh, I, I don't want to sound big headed here, but I wrote both of them. <laughs> and she said, is that generally known? It was <laughs> remarkable. So she put her foot in it twice in the course of a minute. <laughs> Did the conflict between them uh, um, help in their creativity, do you think, um, during the 60s? I mean, they turned out some astonishing work in, in a very short period of the time. Again, very similar to the Beatles. Yeah, oh, but yeah so they, I mean, they, did, they weren't as productive as the Beatles. Mm. I mean, they, they, they were still fairly slow in making their albums mm. and things. But nearly every track and every album counts. There's some story yeah, behind yeah. it. And it's so varied. Yeah. I mean, if, if you take Bob Dylan, for example, he tends to get into a groove, as with, say, Nashville Skyline. Mm. And once he's got that groove, he can make the whole album like that and write the whole songs around that groove. Simon isn't like that at all. Mm. Every every song is jumping from one sort of sound to another, so mm. he's all over the place, and he's continued along that vein mm. now. I mean, I, I, the Stranger to Stranger, I think, is a very very good album. Was a very big album this year, and um, the rhythms on it are great, but. He doesn't have the big melodies anymore. He doesn't seem to be writing the big melodies anymore. Maybe he doesn't want to. Maybe he can't. I don't know. Mm. Uh, but I think if he were to get back with Garfunkel, which I think is unlikely at this stage, but who knows what will happen. Some huge charity show could come up and they change, they get back together. But if he were to get back with Garfunkel and they were to make records again, He'd have to go back, I think, to his old way of writing and write those big melodies mm. for Garfunkel's mm. voice. I mean, there's a wonderful song on There Goes Rhyming Simon called American Tune, uh, which actually isn't an American tune at all because uh, Simon took it from Bach, so Sacred Hearts, so Wounded. But it's an absolutely marvellous record. I think the mm. best song that uh, oh, Paul Simon ever sheer did. Sheer poetry, isn't and it? And Garfunkel, I, I know, said to Simon, why didn't you get in touch with me when you wrote that song? It's perfect for mm. me. Mm. And indeed, when they have had reunions, he sung that song, and yeah. it is great for yeah. him. It's one of the marvellous songs. Oh. It could have been another bridge over troubled water. Absolutely. It means so much. Um, Britain meant quite a bit to Simon and Garfunkel, well, you know, well, interestingly, well, it, for Americans. It, it, indeed. And this, this is uh, taking something back to my roots, seeing what happened on Merseyside, mm. because uh, he was touring around the folk clubs. He appeared in Witness um, mm. for a folk club that was run by uh, my friend Jeff Speed, who used to do folk scene on Radio Merseyside. And he had Paul Simon on, on the 12th of September 1965. And... If you take my Paul Simon book, yes. or my Simon the Garfunkel book, yes. whatever it is, uh, page 46, I think it is. <laughs> I know the pages That's knowing on your book, yes. Yeah. And <laughs> in, in here, they've got the accounts of the Witness Folk Club, so I was delighted to uh, find those. Mm. And we printed that, and it says, September the 13th, 1965, Paul Simon, £12. And uh, he wrote Homeward Bound while he was in Witness, but uh, Jeff maintains that Simon was in Birkenhead the night before, and that's why it's rather a negative song. <laughs> he doesn't have bad things to say about witness. But while he was in uh, the UK, he heard Martin Carthy doing Scarborough Fair, mm. and so he worked up an arrangement of that. He heard Davy Graham, or no, he heard Bert Yanks playing Davy Graham's Angie, mm. and uh, he recorded that as an instrumental. So England was very, very important to him, and, and in one of his songs he does say, to England where my heart lies. So mm. he, he's always loved it here, and mm. Garfunkel's been the same way, they love this country. And so there's quite a bit about England in the book. And so back to Mersey Beat. <clears throat> um, You've written a lot about Mersey Beat. Do you think there's a danger of it being overshadowed um, by the Beatles legend all these years on? That um, the importance of Mersey Beat outside of the Beatles, because, you know, 300 other bands or however many bands there were, many of which were extraordinary bands. Yes, I mean, I, I hate doing questions like, uh, if this didn't happen, what if so and so <laughs> true, happened yes. and everything. But what if the Beatles weren't there? Yeah. Was it so extraordinary what happened on Merseyside mm. that it would have happened anyway? Mm. Uh, nobody would really know, but I think mm. something would have happened, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. There were so many clubs here where people could play. There were so many bands who were doing 
their version of American rock and roll and mm. doing it very well. And there's a CD that's now come out of a complete performance of Rory Storm and the Hurricanes in St John's Hall in Crosby in 1960. And it's very good indeed. Mm. I mean, it, it's great fun. They take an American song like the song about Elvis going in the army, all American boy, and Rory Storm does a Liverpool version of this. You know, so they, they had imagination, mm. they had wit, mm. and they, were, they knew how to appeal to the audience. Mm. They knew how to be exciting if they wanted to be exciting. So all sorts of things uh, were happening. And I, I, I think that some, something would have broken through. Um, Paul De Noyer, in his book, uh, Wondrous Place, which is about the Liverpool groups, and is a very good book indeed, uh, he says that when the bubble burst for them, for groups like the Searchers and the Mersey Beats, and they stopped having hits, he, he says it didn't bother them too much because they went into cabaret and they were cabaret groups in the first place. Mm. And I, I actually think that that's a bit harsh on them. Um, I, I think they a lot of them had a lot of inventiveness and... Uh, I, th I think something would have happened. I mean, the, the, the searches are tremendous, yeah. I think. Yeah, Spencer, I couldn't agree more. I could talk for several weeks because yeah. this is such a fascinating well, subject. Well, I know you want to look at all the books here. I <laughs> do indeed. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're coming to the you end of this program. You haven't brought your sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> Can I thank you so much for your time and, and um, a thousand thanks for these wonderful books. Thank, thank you, you Spencer. Thank you. Thank you.